see my other stuff. <laughs> so let's pray. We'll start off with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, are everywhere and fills all things. Treasury of blessings, giver of life, come and abide in us, cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls a good one. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy in us and save us. Amen. Well, welcome to year four of Orthodoxy 101, which surprisingly is like year three, which is like year two, which is like year one, because I keep doing the same classes over and over again, uh, because we have new faces here, people interested in the church. And so um, the whole point of the, of the class, and we got lots of people who show up online, and the whole point of the class is to learn the basics of the church and to be able to understand. Ask questions. Whatever questions you want, just ask them. And we'll stop what we're doing. Don't do what my students do at the seminary. They love to get me off on tangents. They'll ask a bizarre question. I'll go off on a tangent. Um, but, you know, that's, this is the whole point. And so there's a sequence that follows. We will try to keep it to one hour. We will learn about that sequence today. And then um, each class is sort of independent. So... You can, you can miss a class and then pick right up and you won't be off. Uh, all the classes are on Facebook Live and then on Friday mornings I take it and I post it on our YouTube, which has from the last three years worth of classes, which is interesting when I go back and see how I did one one year and then differently the year before. And so um, anyway, so that's what, what this is basically about. And we're going to continue moving. Now, as you know, this year we added a second type of class, which we will do on alternate Sunday afternoons after coffee hour called In-Depth Orthodoxy. And um, that is actually presented by somebody in the church who wants, who's interested in a particular subject and presents it. And then people can talk and, and, and discuss about a particular topic. Uh, we have, this week, uh, this Sunday we have it, and it's on Judaism. And Lon's going to be presenting because he's a convert from Judaism. So he's going to explain what he learned growing up in Judaism and then how that beautifully went into him becoming a Christian, an Orthodox Christian. So anyway, so that's what it is. And I always use this. There's a lot of stuff here. This was actually, this presentation was put together when I was asked to give a presentation to an, uh, an Episcopal church on icons, and I thought, well, I might as well give people an understanding of what we're talking about as Orthodox before we talk about icons. And so a lot of this we won't go into in depth, but we will at least get this chance to kind of, because I have great pictures there. And uh, by the way, so just to give you a little thing, so that's our cathedral in Washington, D.C. That's our, so you can see the beautiful iconography. It looks bigger than what it is. Let's just put it that way. It's very traditional in Orthodox churches. They build high, not out. Um, and this is actually the church in Parma, uh, Ohio, and that's at the election of Metropolitan Tikhon. And if you look at that, I always thought this was a great shot of what the church is with Christ. You have the, the, the clergy, the lay people, the synod of bishops there, and on that podium is me <laughs> giving instructions on how, to vote, how the procedures for voting. Not that I'm that, but anyway, I just love that church because it just encapsulates what we think. So, um, just a few things to begin with. You, this will become evident as we get on to the class why I gave you this, all right? So, uh, just to do that. question that a lot of people ask is books. What books should you read if you're interested in starting to learn about the Orthodox Church? And we have all these books. There's a library over there, and... It's just for that, borrow whatever books you want. We've been building it up and all that. The classic book, the one that everyone should read, is The Orthodox Church by Timothy Ware, uh, better known as Callistos Ware. He just recently passed away. He was an Oxford professor. Uh, I have a great picture of him and I when he's telling jokes in Latin. I have no idea what he's speaking about. But um, it kind of like runs through theology, history, just sort of everything that, that you need to know and um, it, it's just one of these standards. I promised you a book. Thank you. Have you read this one yet? You have it. Oh, I have. Uh, you have it. Okay. The next book I recommend <laughs> is Father Alexander Schmemann, who uh, who is a very one of the greatest theologians in the 20th century in America. 
Dean of St. Vladimir's, uh, helped establish this parish, actually. Um, his son-in-law, Father Thomas Hopko, who is the, also one of the great theologians and the um, president of St. Vladimir's Seminary, also was the priest here for 10 years. So, uh, so this is your classic book. Jean-Luc, how are you? I keep seeing you in church and then you disappear before I can talk to you. <laughs> Have a seat. Come where you can see. So, for the life of the world is your kind of your basic examination into what we call sacramental theology. You know, like what do we mean by these sacraments? What do we mean about baptism, chrismation, communion, all that stuff? It's 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 a classic. I recommend it. It's not heavy, um, even though Shemin could be. So you get back to it. She gets all these gifts. I just told her I was going to get books. The last set of books I recommend is the four volumes. It's commonly called the Rainbow Series, written by Father Thomas Hopko, who was a priest here for 10 years. And it's a basic uh, set on different things. It has spiritual, it has, goes with doctrine, scripture, worship, church history, spirituality. And it kind of gives a whole kind of overview. So uh, this is one of those books you should just have in your library. And you can always refer to things and stuff like that. Uh, this is the re reprinted version by the seminary. The older ones were weird shaped and weird colored, but this is the reprinted. It's supposed to be a fifth volume. Are the, were those those skinny yes. ones? Yes. Yeah. So this is the new reprinted. So, do you want these now, or do you want? Yeah, actually, I do. Thank okay. You. There you go. There's a bunch of downtime at my job. So oh, there you go. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> but there are other copies of, of that in the library. So whatever you guys want, on the way out, just stop in the library. Library? Library. <laughs> Library. My wife teasing me about this all the time. That's my New Jersey. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so that's, um, so th those are your recommended readings. The other question that I get before we get into this is, what do I need to know to become Orthodox? Well, there's no test. There's only one test when you die, right? <laughs> the eternal test. But I would recommend three things that you should start working on. The first one is to learn the Trisagion prayer, all right? O Holy God, Holy Mo O Heavenly King, that's the beginning like we just did, all the way through Holy God, all the way through the Our Father. We do it so many times in church, you're gonna remember it just because we do it a gazillion times in church. <laughs> the second one is the Nicene Creed, all right? And we're gonna have a class just on that. Again, we say that in all the services. It's the basic creed that was put together in 325 AD on what you need to, be, to believe as a Christian. It's your standard sort of creedal statement. I believe in this, 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 and this. Put together by the church fathers. So, and again, we do it so many times, you'll learn it. The third thing are the pre-communion prayers. And those are, we do all together right before communion when we all are, are together in the church. You do, again, we do it all the time together. You just learn them, just learn them. So those are the type of things I recommend. Again, no one's tested on it, but start doing it because not only are they, well, first off, like the Our Father, when Christ says in the gospel, right? When you pray, you pray like this. And he says, he gives us the Our Father. So if Christ is telling us that when you pray, you pray like this, we should pray like this, right? Um, so that's so that's inc incredibly important. And so you got your prayer, you got your basic beliefs, and then you have your understanding of what it means to be a member of the church and, and receive communion. Very simply put together in those three different prayers. Any questions before we move on to the next step? And I take a sip of coffee. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So who can tell me who's not? What orthodox means? Has anybody heard that phrase, right? It comes from two Greek words, orthos and doxa. It means correct praise. In Russian, pravoslavni, uh, correct worship. And so that is a very bold claim that the orthodox make, that we say that we are orthodox, we are saying that we are worshiping in a particular way that has been handed down to us. The liturgy, the services I do, date from the earliest part times of the Christian world. Earliest, like, you could look at the, the book, the Daki, which was actually put together 
before the Gospels were put together. And we actually do what it says when you do communion. This is how you do it. In the basic form, that's what we're doing. Now, over the centuries, it, of course, gets expanded and, and all of that. But the basic forms of how we worship are important. And why is that important? How we worship determines in what we believe. Now, think about that amongst other denominations or religions. The basic form of belief is through worship. So worship is, is the central and most important thing about being an Orthodox Christian. It's not an intellectual pursuit, but it's a prayer. It's a way in which we pray. In a technical sense, you can say a theologian is a theologian is someone who prays. That's not me, that's one of the church fathers. Literally, theologos, words about God. And so when we do the liturgy up there, we're tapping into 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years, of Christian worship that has been handed down from generation to generation to generation. When I was a young priest, my bishop in the West told all the young, young priests, he sort of sat him down and he said, remember, you don't pass on that which you have not received. And that's so important for us to remember. What has been given to me as the priest is what I will pass on to the next priest and onward. And we've been doing that for 2,000 years. And so when we say that we are orthodox, we don't say this in a triumphal way. We say that in a hum humble way. That this is what we have been given, and this is what we will protect, and this is what we will carry on. And despite the many cultures that are out there, and we'll, we'll talk about it in a bit, that are orthodox, have been orthodox for 2,000 years, and, or shorter terms, they grabbed the orthodox faith and they had and the culture grew out of their, their faith. So that's why you hear people like the Russian Orthodox, or the Serbian Orthodox, or the Romanian Orthodox, or the Greek Orthodox. They're all the same. We're all in communion with each other. The only difference is some cultural things, some language, theology, 100%. Now think about that. All the, there's 14 Orthodox churches in the world, each with the head of the church. For 2,000 years, we've all been preaching and saying the same things from Ethiopia, all the way out to Siberia, all the way to Alaska, to the United States, everywhere that we have been. And so you can go to any Orthodox church. I've been to, what, 54 countries? I walk into an Orthodox church, I know exactly what's going on. And when we hear, like, for example, this Sunday, we'll hear the reading, the Gospel and the Epistle reading, that's the same Epistle and Gospel reading that's being read across the entire Orthodox world on that day. Isn't that amazing? To think about that. So the church is there to exist, most importantly, to bring us to God. So that we worship, so we can create a relationship with God. Everything we do in the church is there to deepen our relationship with Christ. So there are, I mean, there are, we're going to talk about this, little traditions, with the little T we call it. But everything else is there to bring us closer to Christ. And so the liturgy, the sacraments, all the different things, even the icons, all the things that we do are all there to, to build our relationship with Christ. So, that first line, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. All right, so that's the claim we make. It's right in the creed. I believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So what does that line mean? That's the most important line. Well, no, it's, there are more important lines in there. So the church is one. One. That means you cannot divide the church. You can leave the church. You can disagree with the church, but the church remains one. And so that's why I was saying you can go anywhere in the world where there's an Orthodox church and you know exactly what's going on. But it's more than that. We speak with a one voice. Even in the United States, where it's all complicated because of the Russian Revolution, we have all these different jurisdictions, the Greek Orthodox Church and the Antiochia, and all that other... What was that? A whistle? <laughs> I'll check a train whistle. All those different things, yet that we are still one. 
I could go to the Greek church and receive communion. They can come here, which they do. You know, we do. We can all do that because the church is singular. It's always one. Father Hopko used to say, when it comes to the doctrine of the church, we have a, a unity that rivals the Trinity. And the Trinity is perfect unity. So you won't see our doctrine change. You won't see the dogma change. You won't see all that stuff. Uh, because it's been established and it's been fought out. And for the Orthodox, you know, we'll figure it out in 200 years. Let's argue it for a couple hundred years. Then we'll, we'll get the answer. We're okay with that. Because it works itself through patiently. And in some cases, for example, one person, one bishop stood up against a particular issue. Just one. And yet, over the time, it proved that he was the right one and everyone else was wrong. Mark of Ephesus, by the way. Um, so, remember that idea of oneness. So, you were either in the church or you're not in the church. Now, what happens outside the church? That's not for us to judge. That's for God to judge. God, as Father Florowski would say, God's light shines like the sun, it goes everywhere, right? So everything gets illuminated. We Orthodox get the full brunt of it, so we can get burned pretty quickly, right? But the God's light will go where God's lights will go. But we claim that we have the fullness of this, which means that we have to take that responsibility with humility, with humility, that this has been handed down to us. So there's a... There's a People always talk, well, what about heretics and schisms and all that sort of stuff? Well, you can break from the church. That's a schism. You know, then people have broken from the church. The, break between, the great schism between the Orthodox and the Catholic, for example, in 1054. Um, that's a whole, we we're not going to get into that today. But these things happen, but yet we remain the same. A heretic is someone who knowingly teaches something that's untrue and leads people away from it. I remember, I always tell this story. I was in the Trinity class. We have a whole semester of just studying the Trinity, which makes your brain actually hurt at the end of each class. And Father, I kept trying to explain some point. Father Hopko kept saying, no, no, no. And I said, oh, make one mistake and I'm a heretic. He goes, you're not important enough to be a heretic. You're just misguided, <laughs> which is a, an important point. He was doing it as a joke. But that and a heretic is someone who's very important, who leads people away. So that's why when you hear, especially when you, we come up to Sunday of Orthodoxy, the first Sunday of Great Lent, um, there's all these kind of harsh language about people like Arius and some of the Nestorius and these people who uh, taught this untruth and he called like a second Judas and you know it's a, you know Lucifer you know sort of thing the church is serious about it because they're breaking away from the unity of the church and they're leading people into untruth so that's who a heretic is so none of you can be heretics you're not important <laughs> so just remember that the next book one is holy so the word holy what is what do you think it means I'm going to do this a couple of times because it's a setup question. But anybody, what does holy mean? Oh, you guys are too afraid. <laughs> so, holy comes from the Greek word. We're going to learn Greek today because, again, a lot of the theology is written. Greek is a very precise language. Uh, not new Greek, the old Greek. <laughs> very precise. And so, uh, you know, the Gospels were written in Greek, etc., um, they argued over a single letter. A single letter in a word. We'll get to that at some point. So the Greek word for holy is agios. Agios. Which means other. Now think about that. If you have someone who's holy, I'm sure we've all met someone who has a certain holiness about them. There's something other about them, right? There's something not worldly about them. There's something that's different about them. Well, who's the ultimate holy? Jesus. God, right? God is holy. Right? We sing that, right? Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy in us. Um, he is the ultimate other. He's not like us. Yet he is, he became one of us. Yet he's not like us. And so when we say that the church is holy, we are saying that it's it's something other about it. 
that while we live in this world, and we are, we're placed in this world, we should never be of this world. Because when you become of the world, you get swallowed by the world. And time and time again, when the church kind of got too involved in some of those things, things happened to the church. So we always remember that. The church is holy because it's other. And the whole point of the church is to make us holy or other. So when we say that the church is holy, we're saying that there's something more that we're striving for than just material wealth or whatever it may be. We're striving for holiness, for otherness. Okay. Catholic. Who knows what that word means? Universal. No. No. <laughs> no. That's Actually, what it does. I was told. What did you say? Universal. Universal. Oh, so it comes, let's go back to the Greek. Kata olos, which means according to the whole. In other words, fullness, completeness. Universal is a secondary meaning. I even get my seminarians on this one. But more importantly is this understanding of what it means according to the whole. In other words, the church is full. It's lacking nothing. When the Holy Spirit rested upon the apostles, he didn't give them a little portion of that Holy Spirit. He gave the Holy Spirit. And they, whose apostles, laid their hands upon the successors, which continue all the way to today. So every bishop in the Orthodox Church, we'll talk about this in a second, can trace themselves back to the apostles. And every priest who's ordained has the hands laid upon him traces himself through the bishop back to the apostles. But this idea of fullness, it means we're lacking nothing. Everything we need is found here. I can do every, I'm commissioned by the bishop, I can do everything here except one thing. I can't ordain. Only a bishop can ordain. I can baptize, I can chrismate, I can do the liturgy, I do the funerals, I do the wedding, we have a wedding tomorrow. Um, all those receive confessions, all those things. Everything we need from birth to death and beyond is found in the church. Everything. And, and when, you, you, when you start to learn more about the Orthodox Church and you see the cycle of services, in one year we bless all of creation in one way or another. One way or another, we, we, we are there returning things to God because it's already God. And we're trying to learn how to use it in the glory of God. Yes, go ahead, Steve. I know another thing you can't do. What? You can't bless the baptismal chrism. That's true. I can't bless chrism. That's only for the bishops. <clears throat> Thanks. <laughs> but I can stir it. The, bishop, the priests sign up and they're the ones who stir it. And you can apply it. Yeah, and I can apply it. So, yeah. So, anyway. So, this idea of, of fullness, of completeness. Everything we do is in that. So, one holy Catholic and then apostolic. Well, as I explained, one meaning is the apostolic succession. Every bishop, every priest through a bishop, every bishop goes all the way back to the apostles. He talked about the chrism. What is the chrism? We'll learn about that next week when we do the tour of the church. The chrism is a holy oil that's blessed by the head of the church once a year on Holy Thursday. It has all these different ingredients in it that come from the Old Testament. And that chrism has the old chrism, which has the old chrism, which goes all the way back to the apostles. And so they, we make these big vats of it, and the priests sign up, and you stir, and they read prayers, and they do all this stuff, and then we pour it out into jars. That used to be one of my jobs in the chancery. When the bishops would come in, they'd say, how many bottles of chrism do you need to take back? I would fill it up to jars, and then into little bottles, and they would take it back and distribute it to their priests. And so every altar has some of that oil, and when you're received, either baptized or chrismated, you have that oil. You're anointed with it, which brings you then into this connection with this church that goes back 2,000 years. And when I open it up next week, you'll know immediately that I've opened up the chrism because the smell is beyond belief. 
it is an incredible. When I would open the big jars, like the whole chancery would suddenly smell, and every the metropolitan would come out and say, "I know what you're doing." <laughs> all of a sudden, you could smell it. So, that's the one thing we have. But there's another word for apostolos. The church is apostolic. Apostolos means to be sent. Right? The apostles are sent. We have apostles to this day. You are sent into the world. The church is sent into the world. We're not supposed to sit here and hide our light under a bushel. We're meant to go out into the world and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not in a way that's obnoxious and in your face sometimes. But we do that because the church is sent. Right from Matthew uh, 28, right from all these different gospel verses, it says, go forth. And so we are all called to be to go forth. The church is called to go forth. Think about this amazing thing, how you start with Christ, and then you have the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul starts churches in the Greek area, and those churches develop, and eventually missionaries end up in Armenia and Eastern, and goes up into Eastern Europe, and that becomes Christian, and then the Russians become Orthodox in 988, then they start sending missionaries all the way across Siberia. And in 1793, they land in Alaska, and they start churches in Alaska. And then that church in Alaska goes down the coast and eventually goes to California. And then people migrate over to the East Coast and start churches over here. And in 1964, they plant a church here in Wappinger Falls, which goes all the way back through all that, all the way back to the Apostle Paul. Yeah. What was the first nationality that was Orthodox? Jewish. Jewish. Okay. So if you go to the Holy Land, Jerusalem, Jerusalem and then there's people who don't realize that so many of the Palestinians are Orthodox. I mean, some are Muslim, but some are Orthodox. And you know what they call themselves? Blue bloods. That our blood is pure. We're the first Christians, right? But who was the first convert? Anybody know where the first convert was from from the Gospel? From the, actually from the epistles, Ethiopia, yeah. the eunuch yeah. from Ethiopia. So Christianity established itself in Ethiopia about the same time. And it still remains. My church in, in Las Vegas, a third of my parishioners were Ethiopians, had been Christian for 2,000 years. So there's this beautiful gift that, that the church has been doing. But the Palestinian Orthodox, who are horribly persecuted, maintain their, their, their kind of, they call it their blue bloodness because they've kept the faith despite everything that's gone after them. It's a good question. There we go. So this, yeah. Isn't there an idea that the Ark is in Ethiopia? It is. Oh, there you go. It's in St. Mary of Zion Church. Yes. Don't ever say anything different to an Ethiopian. <laughs> I didn't know if that was something that No, was, that's date. I actually that's I have a cross in my, my office um, that was given to me by an Ethiopian family. It's from that church. That It's a symbol that they put. They're not allowed in the church. Only one man is allowed in the church. He's a monk. His job for the rest of his life is to stand guard over that. And um, when he dies, they replace him. But no one's allowed in. And all he can do is come to the... Gateway. Is that the one where they put, he has a rope tied to him, so if something happens... No, oh, no that's, that's, that's from... Well, old, if technically, if no the Old, old Testament, there, but um, once a year they bring it out, it's all covered, um, and they do it during Timkut, which is the, our Feast of Theophany, their Feast of Theophany, and they bring it in procession, but um, no one sees it. you think that would be better now. They've been do, keeping it safe since... Uh, Queen of Sheba in right. the Old Testament. So I think they kind of know what they're doing. <laughs> so anyway, so this idea of being apostolic, of going out into the world, is so critically important. So now you're starting to get this idea about the church being one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. You start seeing that there's something very different about what we're talking about here. But that final word is the key word, church. In, in Greek, ekklesia. It's a gathering. A gathering of the holy. That you have to have people to be a church. And it has to be a church. I've noticed, especially among some um, 
evangelical and non-denominational groups now, they, they don't even put the word church into their title anymore. Community or this or that. And, and they're missing the whole point. That what is a church supposed to be? It's there to lead us to God. But it has to be a gathering. I, Father Eric, cannot serve that liturgy by myself. I can't. I need a congregation. The technical rule is three people. You need a priest, you need a choir, and you need a, per, uh, a congregation, right? But there's no private mass that I do. Because the mass, that's, that's illogical. The liturgy, the liturgy in Greek means work. We're doing the work of the people. Well, if you don't have people, how can you do the work? And so when we, do, when we are a church, we are gathered as a church, we are gathered as a community, yes. We are also gathered as a communion. Because the central act of the church is the divine liturgy and the Eucharist. And so we are a communion. And in Greek that means kononia. And unfortunately that word gets a weak I did my whole doctoral work on this word. Um, it gets a very weak sort of meaning, like fellowship. It's not at all what it means. Just look at Acts. And it talks about the communion, the kononia of people, and they were breaking bread and receiving the Eucharist together and sharing everything in common. A kononia is much stronger than a fellowship. It's literally coming together in communion with God. So we, when we gather together there for church on Sunday, we are a kononia, a gathering of people, receiving the Eucharist of one heart, one mind. Right, that, right before I do the creed, I say, one heart and one mind, let us confess. This idea of coming together. So that idea of the church is an incredibly important and very important word. Go ahead, Steve. Well, you said a choir is required. Is it, is it true that it could be just chanted or does it? Yeah. Be? Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Just one person. Right. But it, so it doesn't necessarily have to be sung like a choir. No, but there are traditions like the Greek tradition, the Byzantine tradition, you just have one chanter. You, yeah. don't, have, you don't have a choir. You have a chanter. That's fine. There are different traditions on that. Um, my, uh, yeah, sometimes it's just my wife singing for me. <laughs> you know, so, but sometimes we have a full choir. But that's okay. You know, I had, I, it seems I was, like she will, she will go into chant sometime just for economy of time. Yeah, well... Her voice is holding up. When I was in Las Vegas, we would do a 7 a.m. Wednesday morning liturgy every week. And I had this group of about 20 people who would come, go to do the liturgy, and then they would go to work. And I had a monk who would sing it for me. And so, not well, by the way, but he sang it for me. But it was beautiful in the sense that we had this just this simple sort of litur liturgy with just the priest and the monk chanting with me. But anyway... So that word, so that phrase, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, is an incredibly important thing. How can we say that that's true? How can we make that claim? Because everyone claims to be the church, right? Well, that's what we're going to start to discuss in a little bit. But I want to make a couple of other points before we get to that. So we talked about the apostolic succession. This is my favorite one. We're not denominational. We're pre-denominational. Right? Where before there was such a thing as denominations, we existed. So we always joke with people about that. It's like, what denomination are you? Well, we're Orthodox, but we're not a denomination with the church that have existed since the beginning. And, well, we already talked about it. By the way, that's the church, that's one of our oldest churches in Alaska. That was, that was formed in Alaska with the cemetery around it. And we have Dorothy, you know, her, her family. That's not far from where her family's from in Alaska. And they have been Orthodox for over 200 years. Isn't that amazing? And they're very strong Orthodox. They've been horribly abused, but they remained. <clears throat> so, just a few more things. We are a Trinitarian church. In other words, we believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You'd be surprised how many groups out there that claim to be Christian don't believe in the Trinity. Salvation Army, do you know that's a, that's a church? People didn't know that. It's a non-Trinitarian. Where they have this strange idea about what the Trinity is. 
This is, that's why the creed is so important, because it defines in the first three articles who and what the Father is, who and what the Son is, and who and what Jesus, uh, the Holy Spirit is. And every time, how many times do we do? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? You hear this over and over again. You won't hear us say, pray in the name of Jesus. We pray in the, Holy, in the, in the name of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, we pray in the name of Jesus, obviously. But for us, that's so important. Even when we do the sign of the cross, which you'll see. These three fingers, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. These two fingers, Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. And we go, head, bless our head, our hearts. We go to the right. Everything's to the right. Watch right. How many times do you tell the other part? Turn to the right. <laughs> and they're trying to turn around and bow. Father, so it can bless our strength. So, even that. And then, believe me, this was a cause of controversy. Whether you should bless yourself like this, or bless yourself like this. And the church decided this was the proper way. It took a hundred years, but they figured it out. So when you do it, you do it with great reverence and understanding that this is a theological statement, this simple act. When the priest blesses you, it's not because I'm crippled, right? It's actually I-C-X-C. I'm blessing you in, in, literally in the name of Christ. I-C-X-C, Jesus Christ, the Greek initials. I'm blessing you in the name of Christ. If you were a bishop, you get to do two hands. But I don't want to be a bishop. <laughs> <laughs> My wife has to die. I want that. But I bless you literally in the name, with the, the name of Christ. So um, we are the church of the Bible. I always crack up when people say, are you? I get this all the time. Are you, the, are you the church of the Bible? We're the church that gave you the Bible. We know that. How, how did the Bible get put together? Well, those books. Council of Carthage, they gathered together to something. And they said, okay, how many people here have the Gospel of Mark? Because it was all written for different particular reasons. And they said, well, okay, this seems to be the same copy, so this we can, we can authenticate this. How about the letter from Paul to the Thessalonians? Okay, good. How about um, the Gospel of Thomas? Well, you have it, but we're not. it's kind of a different version than what you have. And it's not quite so, nope. There are parts of it we, we, could, we can say is part of, of the tradition of the church, but other parts are not. So there's no gospel of Thomas. That's why they always, oh yes, they discovered a new gospel that overturns it. No, the church knew about all of them. They rejected them because it didn't fit within the, the rest of the, of, the, of the theology and the, and the um, understanding of the church. And there wasn't this clear-cut line that they can authenticate that this was original and, and proper and, and, and had been handed down. And so they put it all together, and they all voted on it, all the bishops, and they agreed. Revelations made it by one vote, but it was said never to, it was as an example of, of, a, of a type of writing. It's never read liturgically in the church because the liturgy is the ultimate revelation. And it was written to encourage the Christians who were being persecuted by Nero and Rome. So it's not like some secret thing to be decoded and find the end times. No, there's things about it that talk about it. But ultimately, every liturgy you see revelations in act. So and that's how the Bible came. That's called the canon. The canon is the word, Greek word, not for shooting things. It's ruler, measuring stick. So that's the canon, how the canon was put together. Yeah. Why Carthage? Because at that time, Carthage was, was the Christian center. That was where the theologians were coming. Athanasius, Alexander, uh, uh, Anthony, all these the great theologians were all around that area. And then it sort of moved. Well, there was the, the, the dispute, dispute between the Antiochian school and the Alexandrian school. We won't go into it. But... Um, and, but that was, the, that was a, North Africa was where they were. That's where the real, at that time. Of course, it moves in different places. Yeah, it was more Alexandria, but I guess we went there for a summer retreat or something. But Carthage was more, at that time, much more important city. Okay. I don't know why the church chose it. 
Who knows? But anyway. So, anyway, so we ask if you're the church of the Bible. Yes, we are the church of the Bible with the church. It gave you the Bible. And everything we do in the church, every single thing is biblical. There is not a word in that liturgy that cannot be traced in, in, in the Bible. I have a, a, a liturgy book in, next, in my office, and this side is the words of the liturgy, and this side are all the, where, the, where it comes from in, in the Bible. There's not a, a made-up word or a made-up theology. It's all right there. Every We were just talking about this in the seminary yesterday. All the sacraments are based on a Bible. For example, when we do the service of unction, when we anoint people who are sick, and it comes right from Timothy. Is any among you sick? Gather the elders, priests, that's the Greek word, presbyter, elders, that's what it means, and pray over them and anoint them. That's what we do. To do the unction service right, you need seven priests who do seven gospel readings, seven epistle readings, seven prayers, and seven anointings. So that we'll gather communities. Usually Pearl River was doing it for a while, where they would do it once a year, and then we'd all send everybody there. But uh, we'll talk more about that in another class. It's right from the Bible, but we still do it. We gather the priests together and we anoint them. So uh, everything we do is based off of what is in the Bible. Next. So we live, and we're going to talk about this in a couple of classes, but we live from liturgy to liturgy. Sunday is not the last day of the week. Sunday is the first day of the week. And we start the week off by receiving the Eucharist. Now, because the way time is now, and people think of vac you know, weekends off, they think Sunday is the, is the end of the weekend. It's not. It's the beginning of the week. And we live from liturgy to liturgy. We live from, and Sunday, you really want to get blown away? It's not the seventh day, it's the eighth day. <laughs> because the eighth day is out day outside of time, because it's seven calendar days, but every time we serve that liturgy, we're outside of time and into the resurrection of that. I don't want to confuse you, Terry. Because <laughs> I don't understand it either. <laughs> that hurts a little. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the, the day of the day. It's a day beyond the day. But anyway, so we live in this cycle. But we also live from Easter to Easter. In the Orthodox Church, Easter is called Pascha which means Passover. And it's the Passover from death to life to death again. It is the liturgical center of the year. So in the West, Christmas is the big holiday. And it's important, very important in the Orthodox Church. But Easter, Pascha, is the feast of feasts, the holiday of holidays. And everything is based around that. The point is not necessarily that Christ became man. The point of it is that Christ died and rose from the dead, therefore for abolishing death. Which is why we sing on Easter, and you'll hear it over and over and over again. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. And every Sunday is a small Pascha. So if you listen carefully to the hymns, you'll notice they're all resurrected, except for, you know, you have the saints and you have all the different things, but the normal hymns that you do are all about the resurrection. We're celebrating the resurrection. It'll become more clear next week when I explain the church. So we live in the cycle from Easter to Easter, from Pascha to Pascha, from liturgy to liturgy. All of a sudden you start to think, I'm not living in the world. I'm living in a different way of thinking. Yes, we have to go to work and we have to go to school and we have to do all those sort of things. But those are secondary when we think about what it is that we're supposed to be in our lives. So we live in that. So I'm excited for the new people because you've never experienced Holy Week. And boy, Holy Week is amazing. And if you go through the whole Lent and do everything and then you go to your first Pascha service when the Orthodox get down and get funky, and we do, <laughs> um, you're going to be blown away. Just blown away. And we start at midnight and we usually finish around what? When did we finish last year? 3 3 3.30. 3 30. Yeah. It goes like that. And then we party. Because we haven't eaten meat and haven't had all the stuff. And we come down here and we just eat stuff ourselves and all the food we haven't done. 
and just partying till the sun comes up. And then we go home for a little bit and we come back for church and party a little more. So you'll have fun. Um, so anyway, any questions on this stuff? Nope. So where are the Orthodox? So when you speak of the Orthodox, who are, they're all the same, whether you're Russian, Greek, Serbian, you yeah. know. The Orthodox Church in America, who we're under, was part of the Russian Orthodox Church. So we were from the first missionaries. Remember, Alaska used to be part of Russia. So St. Herman of Alaska, the first saint in America. We have 14 saints, American saints. We we're about to get our 15th. We're close on Matushka Olga, an Alaskan woman, a Native American woman. Um, so uh, the Orthodox Church was part of the Russian church, and as I said, it came down into California and San Francisco, and then the immigration from the other side, Northeast, like my family that came over after World War I uh, to escape the communists, and then now we're kind of meeting in the middle. So we are under the Russian Orthodox Church until 1970. All the Orthodox in, in, the, in, the, in America were under the Russian church until 1917, because that's when the Russian Revolution happened. And they cut off all the connections. The, the communists came over here, tried to take over churches. There was lawsuits that went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, so that we could keep what we had. And so if you were Greek, you went under a Greek bishop, you found it. If you were Serbian, you found a Serbian bishop, you survived, thinking that this isn't going to last. But it happens. And it just survived. So we, and, and the, we were called the, the Russian Orthodox Greek Catholic Metropolia <laughs> of, you know, the Russian Orthodox Church. It was some long title. Um, we survived. We had, we were able to get bishops. We were able to get priests. We, we kept communication open, quietly. And then Father Schmemann, amongst others, really had this vision of saying, we need to have a church that's here in America for Americans, not pretending to be Russians or Greeks or whatever. We're Americans. And so after negotiations, uh, the Russian church gave what's called autocephaly, self-governance. So we as the Orthodox Church in America elect our own bishops, elect our own head of the church, Metropolitan uh, Tikhon is the head of our church. Uh, we'll talk about how that works as well. We make our own chrism, because before we had to smuggle the chrism out of Russia, and then we still have the jar that we used to smuggle it in to get it to America. And we have our own point. And we do, it was very important for us to have an American church in English for all people. Half of our bishops now didn't grow up Orthodox, but came into the church, including our Metropolitan, who actually his, his mother is an Episcopalian priest. <laughs> but, um, but so we embrace all. And so uh, we have Russian roots, so the vestments I wear are kind of Russian style, because I grew up with it and I like Russian style vestments. And the music is Russian style music, um, but we're American. And what's beautiful, because the OCA also has a Romanian diocese, so the Romanian church, we have an Albanian, a Bulgarian, we have a Mexico diocese, we have the Alaskan diocese, we have about 14 dioceses in, in, um, across North America. Uh, we had, in every an average Sunday, the liturgy is probably being celebrated in 15 different languages in the OCA, including five native Alaskan languages, which would have been lost if it wasn't for people like St. Innocent, who was able to record it and establish the writing and keep the language alive. So um, anyway, that's so we're part of that parish. Yeah. Um, years ago, Mark Ellis started peeking in here with our kids because <clears throat> she, the Greek Orthodox, because they couldn't under, really couldn't understand Greek. Mm -hmm. So here, she just realized that, I mean, I don't know if that's the whole reason, but it was in, it was in English. Same with my marriage that I talked about, that I was married, I knew it, but I didn't know. I couldn't hear a word of what they said. This <laughs> Opa was a good word for me. Opa. <laughs> You know, but, when yeah, that's, that's, it's good, it's great to be able to... Well, this parish was established to be the English-speaking parish in this area. I mean, my father's Italian background, my mother's Russian background. Um, he could, became Orthodox. The church that my great-grandfather literally was the, the builder was still in Slavonic when I was a kid. 
And my parents left that church to go to an all English parish when it was established because they knew we would lose our lang we would lose the church because we didn't understand church Slavonic. You know, so um, that's why if you notice in the liturgy we changed the, the one litany where I do the different languages. And I do that on I, I've been waiting to do that because I think it's important that you do Lord have mercy and we do it in Greek and Russian in uh, Spanish in Georgian, Georgian in Romanian and in Arabic you know uh, just to kind of show that yeah we're, we can take all this we, we're all part of us so anyway um, it's beautiful it is beautiful when you do that yeah, yeah. But there's a couple more I want to add in. Um, one of them being um, Albanian, and the other I'd like to do some native Alaskan as well. So eventually we'll do that. Um, so we are where are we concentrated mostly? Well, there's whole countries that are pretty much 90%, 95% Orthodox. Most of them are Eastern Europe and parts of the Middle East, which ironically is where the communists and the Muslims were. So we have been greatly persecuted. In the 20th century, the Orthodox probably lost 40 to 50 million people between the communists and the Muslims uh, killing us. Um, so you can see why so many of them fled. You know, you have whole villages in Turkey that were just totally wiped out by the, by the Muslims. You know, we have a cross upstairs. If you go by the choir, there's a cross in, in, the, in the frame that was given to us by a friend of Kirill's who was in Turkey doing an archeological dig on an old church that was destroyed and they found that cross in the ruins. And so now he saved it and gave it to Kirill, so now we have it upstairs. It's yeah, so that's it's a, it's a kind of a relic of, of that destruction that has happened to the world. So, um, yeah, so, um, so for many of the, we were talking about this, like, People don't know about us. We're like the best kept secret in America. We've been here for over 200 years. We have, you know, thousands of parishes, but we've been pretty much in our own kind of world, right? You know, you kind of have your, like when my great grandparents came, they all settled in an area around the church. I could stand on the front step. There's my grandmother's house, my great grandmother's. They lived in those sort of ethnic ghettos. But over time, all that stuff shifted and the, and the church moved throughout the, the country and we don't have that much as, as more anymore. So anyway, so when we see all that, we can go to Romania, like I was in Romania last year giving lectures, you know, everyone's Orthodox. No matter what town you go into, there's an Orthodox church right there. It's an amazing thing to be when the whole culture is sort of embedded. I always like to say this, so in Russian, the word for Sunday is Voskresne. That's also the word for resurrection. Easter, Christos Voskresen, right? And we say. So even during the communist times of atheism, they still called Sunday Voskresen. It kept that Christian context, but they didn't even realize that that's what they were doing. So the culture was so important. Um, you'll hear people talk about the Oriental Orthodox. So those are the Ethiopian Church, the Armenian Church, the Malankara Indian Orthodox Church, uh, Eritrean, and Coptic, the Egyptian. So they are technically not in communion with what we call the Eastern Orthodox, but it's, a, it's over an issue. I don't want to get into the, the theology of it. But um, they go to our seminaries. We, we have people, you know, uh, Joseph Saad was, is a deacon in the Coptic church. He, he's been part of this church forever. Um, you know, so there, there's some issues. I have a feeling we're probably pretty close to resolving those issues. Um, and I actually was involved with some of the uh, ways. But at this point, they become established. And they have their, you know, their liturgy. Their, their saints and all that sort of stuff. So that's fine. So, anyway, so that's what the Oriental Orthodox are. We won't go through this, we won't go through that, we won't go through that. That's an interesting one to look at if you could see. We have upstairs, we have one of those pamphlets which goes through the timeline and explains how the church remains. And then 
major points within there. But you can, we can look at that later, because again, what does that guy look like? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Father Hopko had a picture. That's Metropolitan Leonti as a young man. People say, why do you have a picture of Father Eric in your office? This is what he looks like when he was Metropolitan, by the way. There's no relation, but I always kind of find it funny. No, it's not me. So let's get to this one. What time is it? Oh, boy, we're almost done. All right, so... <coughs> How do we know what we say is what we say? And that's where this comes in. So remember, we talked about the Orthodox Church. That's the center of everything, right? That's the church. So what feeds into it? What keeps us a church? So first and foremost, the most important thing is what we call holy tradition. Holy tradition is the life of the Holy Spirit that is found within the church that goes from generation to generation to generation. Again, God, on Pentecost, we receive the Holy Spirit. We continue to have that Spirit. And that is found in holy tradition, right? We don't pass on what we haven't received. So, it's, so always think of it this way. Think of it as the river. It's the main river going down the current of time. And holy tradition, sometimes it meanders a little, sometimes it goes over the banks, and sometimes a little, but it's always going in that same direction. So that's holy tradition. We will have a class. Each of these things we're going to have a class on. So I'm just giving you an overview. So, what is the main current of that tradition? The Holy Scriptures. Again, we talked about this. Scriptures is everything we do is scripturally based. Where did the, holy, where did the Scriptures come from, right? Well, we talked about how the church, but did it pop out of heaven? No. It was part of the tradition of the church. And they wrote this stuff down. And as they wrote it down, they gave it to the people. And certain gospels were written for certain audiences. And certain letters from the epistle, that's what epistle means, is letters, were written for certain communities. And that's how the scripture came together. It wasn't magic. It was the writings of the church. And it all conformed with what the church had already been celebrating. Because think about it. Some of this stuff was not written down until way afterwards. But yet it conformed with what the church was already celebrating. So we got that river. That main current that pulls that river along is the scriptures. And the church is the ship. St. Cyprian of Carthage called it the Ark of Salvation. In it, we are safe. Outside is chaos. So the church is floating on that river, guided by that main stream. By the way, the book of canons, you know, the rules of the church is called the rudder. So the rudder steers the ship. And if you ever read the rudder, I'll get angry because it's incredibly complicated. There's nothing more dangerous than a lay person with the rudder because you don't understand it. <laughs> we'll talk about that. But it could be, it's, it's an interesting book. So what else do we have that kind of guides the church along? Well, we talked a bit about this. The canons, the iconography that we have in the church. Nicole saw for the first time some of the iconography. It's our theology. It's, if people ask you, what do we believe? Here it is. This is what we believe. And just as we pray with our mouths, we pray with our eyes. The icons are a prayer. And a way for us to understand what it is that we believe. So how they are written is incredibly important. They, usually they say icons are written, but that's not true. Uh, in Greek, the word for painting and writing is the same word. But, um, but how they're done is, an, is a theological message in each and every one of those, which is why very often on feast days, what do I do? I have to explain why we have this icon and why, what's in it, because this is what it's supposed to, we're supposed to take from it. We have the sacraments of the church. We have the Holy Fathers who from generation to generation have written. And what is so amazing about the Holy Fathers, as Stephen is discovering as he deep delves into that depths that are without limit, mm -hmm. um, is how remarkably consistent they all are. 
Like I can take someone who wrote in the 19th century and someone who wrote in the first century and they're going to be saying pretty much the same thing. And ultimately, by the way, they are the greatest commentators on the scriptures. If you really want to understand this the way Father Hop, our scripture teachers used to tell us, if you're reading the scriptures, you need to have the church fathers at your hand. And if you're reading the church fathers, you need to have the scriptures at your hand because they are remarkable how they understand. And so the church fathers help us define that faith, define the arguments, what was going on and how they disagreed with each other and how they came to that understanding on different theological issues. Um, we have the church year. We've, we've heard a little bit. Why do we celebrate these 12 feasts? Why do we have all these things going on? We have the saints of the church, and their lives are the embodiment. We have the cycle. We have the layout of the church. We have the tradition with the small t. Like, why are we now in gold? But last week we were in red in the church. <clears throat> There's part of the, that message. And then we have the hierarchy. Now that we have our deacon, right? We have a, See how different the service is when you have a deacon? It's, it's slightly different. I don't get to do it. Your job got easier. Yeah, my job gets easier. <laughs> um, but you, why do you, well, who is a deacon? Who is a priest? Who is a bishop? Why do we have these? What's the responsibilities of all the different places? All of these feed into each other. And all of them feed into the church. And all of them keep the pendulum centered. So that if we go too far this way, and some, someone gets a crazy idea, all this other stuff comes and nope, nope, we're back to the center. The narrow path. All of this stuff is there for a reason. And it's to keep that church defined and moving forward. And so that's why we Orthodox will fight about things like calendars, right? Or we'll fight about what color do you wear on, on Easter? In Russia, you wear red. In you know, other places, you wear white. You know, as long as we're fighting about that stuff, we're in great shape because we're not fighting about the divinity of Christ and who he is and all these sort of other issues because that is there and it's established. So what we will be doing over the coming weeks is we'll be looking through each of these areas and starting to understand them and what does it mean when we do baptism and all that sort of stuff. And it will help us kind of understand how all this feeds into the church. Um, next week we'll go and we'll do a tour. We'll go, why is the church set up the way it's set up? So we understand all those things and I'll show you, I was like, the single most important thing in the church that we cannot exist without, and you barely ever see it. George knows what it is, because <laughs> he sees it back there. It's the antimensia, it's a permission from the bishop to exist. So, are there questions? I promise you I won't go over an hour, but I, I never could. Kyle, you're good? Anybody? Yes, go ahead, Hank. I think I remember you saying this, or whatever. The church itself, it looks like a ship. It could be built like a ship. Yeah. Yeah. Very often, you can have either as a ship or as a cross. Right. So it depends on you know how they design it. But yeah, if you look at the upstairs at the church, it actually looks like the bottom of a ship. Right. Does it mimic the ark? Yep. Yep. The ark where there is safety. <laughs> Everything else is created. The church is an ark. It's 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 the the Old Testament temple. It's the. Uh, the Roman um, Basilica, the, all that is kind of is, is kind of feeds into it, and we'll see next week why it's set up the way it is, um, in order to give us that message. Even the architecture of the church is incredibly important. <coughs> why it is designed the way it's designed. Gotta uh, face east, right? Gotta face east. The altar is always east, unless you're at Saint Vladimir Seminary. The altar is facing west, but it's it's facing east. It's liturgical east. <laughs> They couldn't do it any other That's way. That's why you spit the incense. So. Yeah. Because <laughs> the, the church always faces where the sun comes up, and then the sun comes down. Any other questions? Do we have any? Oh, mom's watching. <laughs> Didn't I tell you? <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so we'll pick up again next week. Uh, one thing I will say, normally we do every Thursday, we have a uh, class.
The first Thursday of every month, I'm going to have to not have class. I'll let you know that because I ha I'm also the chaplain for the fire department and, uh, and for the police department and their meetings on the first Thursdays of every month and I have to be there to do the opening prayer and to counsel whoever wants to talk to me and everything. So anyway, so I'm sure you'll all survive with one less <laughs> class a month. But anyway, there it is. So have a blessed day. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. It is truly me to bless you, O Theotokos, ever blessed and most pure in the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. Without corruption, you gave birth to God the word. True, Theotokos, we magnify you. Through the prayers of our holy fathers, O Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen.